This is not a test. Stay calm in an orderly fashion. Make your way to the lifeboats. Today is our Wednesday podcast, which means that we're going to be doing a little bit of meditation. We're just going to kind of talk about, you know, where we're at in life. We might ask some philosophical questions. We might discuss the deeper meaning to life. You know, why are we here? Who are we? Why are we? You know, things like that. So why are we who? Why are we who? Yeah. Ooh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, we're just going to kind of discuss a little bit about where we're at and uh, what we're doing in our life. So, uh, Christian, with that being said, man, how are you doing? Man. <laughs> so for those who who may just be tuning in for the first time, we record all these ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, it allows us just so uh, we can edit all of our stupid shenanigans. And you're like, you edit the stupid shenanigans? It's like, <laughs> yes, we edit uh, some of the stupid shenanigans, I should say. But with that being said, we are in the midst of Recovery Coach Academy. We yes. are on uh, Thursday, so day four of RCA. But Hunter and I, much to, I think, both of our chagrins, and the problem, if you ever hang out with Hunter and I, it tends to go like, you know, you, I saw this a lot in addiction. You tell your buddy some, a stupid thing you wanted to do, or you tell them like, okay, let's let's go and do this. And then you know, fast forward uh, a couple of minutes or an hour later, and then all of a sudden you realize both of you are still on the trajectory to go to do that stupid thing. And both of you realize that it's really stupid and you shouldn't be doing this, but neither one of you will let the other cop out. So it's like, just by, you know, somebody put it into the universe, and then all of a sudden it's manifesting itself and you're both in trouble, right? Like, I feel like we do that quite a bit, but it's all with good things. Like, it's all like, we should do this. It's gonna be a lot of work. Okay, let's do it. And then like, we both fast forward and we're like, why did we commit to this? This is so much more work. And that's kind of how I feel about this podcast this morning. Like (laughs) we are filming multiple episodes this morning, because we, uh, we, both are like, well, we kind of want our day after Recovery Coach Academy. For those who've ever taught Recovery Coach Academy or been in it, it's a long week. Yeah, you know, it goes by in a flash, but it's like it takes everything out of you as a trainer. So that's how I'm doing. Yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty much on the same page. I really like what you said. I notice I do that with a, a few different things. Um, I do it with my job sometimes. Where like they'll be like, hey, I'm thinking about this new project. I'm like, that's a great idea. And then it's like the project I'm doing it, and I'm like, I should not have signed myself up for this. Same like this. Yeah, it's 7 a.m. and we're recording podcast episodes and we have Recovery Coach Academy starting in a few hours, you know, and it's just it's going to be a long day after that. And we're already starting the day off talking, you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, we're going to be <laughs> talking all day. So, you know, we I think I, I will speak for myself. I don't want to speak in generalizations or, or speak for you, but I over you know the first day recovery coach academy i'm fairly energized I'm fairly good uh, i get done i'm like okay i'm a little tired but it's a good day you know it, it was uh, you know the first 15 minutes you always have that anxiety of like man i haven't it's like ride a bike i haven't done it in a, you know three or four months um and especially with covid we're doing a, a virtual recovery coach academy so it's right. like okay how is this gonna go is it gonna go well it was everybody that signed up gonna show up yada 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 and you hope for the best and then you get into it and you feel really good and you're like okay you know you you shake those cobwebs out and you feel feel great this is day number one day number two you're like okay i forgot how much energy this takes out of you like wow i'm i'm tired i'm beat and then day number three you're like boh Oh my gosh, how do people have days after this? And then we're like, hey, you know, it'd be a good idea. It's not like that feeling of of exhaustion is going to get any worse, right? It's probably going to stay the same. Let's add two more hours of talking on top of it. Let's do the podcast in the morning. So, and there's a reason for it. Hunter's going to be going on vacation in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, next week, we have our ethics and and project uh, experts training, brief intervention, referral to treatment trainings. So it's like, okay, now or never. I mean, let's get these things yeah. done, get them in the can for this month and and be on our merry way. So that's why we're doing them in the morning. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I really resonate with what you said about Recovery Coach Academy because the first day, man, it's like, I love this. I'm doing it. Like, I love this job. You know, this is awesome. And then day two comes around. And I'm like, eh, a little bit less awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's only Tuesday right now. Right, and I still got three days left of this. 
Um, and then when Wednesday hit last night, man, I was, I was going to the gym after we got done here and I was like, I was talking to my buddy, I'm like, man, I am just beat. I, I talked about it in the meeting last night. I actually said during the meeting, I'm like, I'm fried. And everyone looked at me. I'm like, not like that. My brain's fried. I've been teaching a class all day, <laughs> but it was, uh, <laughs> it's been just a, uh, man, it has been a, a brain trying three days, I guess. Cause like, it's just constant communication. Like it's, it may be easier. Maybe if we were just talking, you know, or if we were just like reading out of a book, Yeah. but there is so much just like, there's like what the book gives us. And then there's the conversation we have about all. And that's the thing I think, you know, and I've always, I've taken recovery coach Academy as you know, I'm a core trainer. So I've actually had the the director of C. I've spoken to the director of CCAR. I've had the director of training of CCAR sit in one of my classes to see how we taught, how all that thing goes. And, you know, the, the feedback and what we saw was we teach out of the book. And there's a lot of people that just teach out of the book. They read out of the book and then they kind of, it's awkward and, and, you know, it's kind of clunky and it kind of moves forward and you can do that. But the way that we do it, it's like, okay, we're going to teach out of the book, but we're going to almost use every portion of the book as the conversation starter. Mm -hmm. So that we say like, this is the information that you need to know. But on top of that, this is the experiential knowledge that this book isn't going to tell you and this class isn't going to tell you. And then the floodgates open and we're, you know, if, if anybody ever sits in a room with us, especially during a virtual academy, you know, and really, I can say this for a regular academy too, but during a virtual academy, you, we have, it's an entire show. It's an entire operation. Like what people are seeing from us in the computer is just our two faces. If you come in there, there's wires everywhere. There's computers and TVs and monitors going, there's books open. But one of the things that I take pride in that we have found over time in, in teaching this class is we have a master schedule and that master schedule is teed out to the minute. I mean, we, we know where we're going and we know what time we need to be done with things. And we have all the exercises mapped out. So it's like, like you got to do three minutes on that three minutes on that. Okay. Speed it up, speed it up, extend it, extend it. Like, and it, for those of you who are, are like, in the virtual class, what you don't see is Hunter and I are giving like hand signs and right. sign language while things are going to like and like raising my hand, like, like yeah, that. like point <laughs> pointing out different things and like saying you know lengthen things out so yeah. that we we can burn a little bit more time because we're we're very time conscious of like we need to burn time here so we have a little bit more time here we need to make sure we get through this quick because this is a large exercise and regardless of all that preparation. Oftentimes we're still like, whoa, God, we're playing catch up, we're playing catch up, we're playing catch up because there's just so much information. And I honestly, that the Recovery Coach Academy, it's a 30 or it's a five day, 30 CEU class. Virtually, we do it 25 hours uh, online and then they do an hour worth of homework a night. Dude, you could turn that into like a month long class and still not even yeah. touch the surface of half the stuff in it. Well, I mean, we're, yeah, it, I mean, during that, we kind of talked about a little bit on here, but we're talking about things like uh, stages of change, which if you guys haven't heard that first and second episode we did with stages of change, uh, well, not the first and second episode, the first, the first and second Monday episodes, and then the third and fourth Mondays, we did stages of recovery. Yep. So those two topics, like you can dive really deep into those. And then we hit things like motivational interviewing, like, psh, Dude, it, we it, only it, did one on that. We could have done an entire like month's worth of series on it. Easily. Oh yeah. I mean, if you look at motivational interviewing, like if you want to know how much motivational interviewing is out there, anybody in the social work field can probably tell you like go on CEU or like all CEUs for less or something like that. One of those for your company. And you will see there's like 50 part trainings on motivational interviewing all worth like one CEU each, you know, it's like, oh wow, that's... <laughs> So it's there. It's definitely like, it's a so, so broad. We're like, we call it the iceberg effect. So yeah. And iceberg effect, you know, we touch 10% in the class, 90% is kind of out there and we do, we refer readings and things like that, but man, O'Malley, it's, this is always the day it's Thursday and Thursday's cultural competency day, which is always, it's an interesting day. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, tensions run high on this day because you're talking about things that I think are really relevant to culture right now which is really, it's super fascinating. I've been doing Recovery Coach Academy for a while. And cultural, when I first started this, cultural competency was one way. And then things like, you know, things like Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd stuff, when that popped off, um, it's now a different way. So it's a different, it's a different 
beast entirely to to kind of wrangle in and to talk about because guess the tensions run high it's it, there's no way to cut it other than that people feel very opinionated people feel attacked people feel like this is you know that this information I, I feel like doesn't apply to me and more often times than not we hear like I was raised to respect everybody and it's like yeah it, it's a fairly fairly interesting point it's a hard conversation but this is always the day Thursday that I kind of wake up and I all of a sudden realize like hmm we're almost done yeah I just like to say every time that we do this lesson, Christian leaves me in the room by myself to facilitate a 20 minute discussion. I'm like, I'm out of motivational interviewing questions, Christian, throwing pins into the kitchen to get his attention. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I would say about this. <laughs> I actually Facts. did that last time yes, we did this class. True. Yeah. Like, what in the heck do you I threw need? a pin at him. Um, so this, I feel like right now, um, cultural competency, and we do a privilege checklist and things like that during this class, whether people agree with it or disagree with it, it is still a very focal pointed thing in our culture right now. We're seeing a very highlighted sense in that, in that area. So of course, like everyone's grown an opinion or most, I don't say everybody. You, just, are you good? I think I'm good. I, I, my audio cut out for like half a second. For like half a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's so focal pointed right now that everyone, not everyone, I don't want to say everybody, but has an opinion of some sort on, on this thing. You know, everyone's thinking or not, once again, not everybody, I don't want to keep saying that a lot of people have developed an opinion, whether they agree or disagree with the movements that are happening. So it seems, it makes sense to me. There'd be like a high, a really high tension thing right now, since, since this has become a focal point, because before I feel like it was kind of like something we, we knew about something we would talk about, but something that was very, it was almost like a taboo conversation. Sure. Um, to where now it's like it's become normalized to talk about and everyone has or I, I keep saying everybody but a lot of people have formulated an opinion on that subject and it's made it very very controversial to talk about but very just high tension like everyone's like ooh, i don't know about that well and that's very interesting that you bring that up i mean i i guess i never looked at it that from that perspective but now that you bring that up yeah i i definitely i have seen the fact that it def it's certainly become more normalized mm -hmm. it's certainly become something that people are feeling more comfortable to talk about. I still think that there's a vast portion of society that is very uncomfortable with it. And they right. look at it through, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the discussion is painted this way. And I think it's painted this way um, by some on purpose, because first it's a valuable discussion to have. It's a discussion that, that is looking at our history in a completely objective way many of times where you know oftentimes we look at the the history books subjectively what do they say you know the winners write the history books and it's like when you go back through history and you're looking at everything like whitewashed and you know we're talking about a few major events in history and it's just like there were in many ways that there was there were events that were parallel to those that were happening at the same exact time that were worse and they're not talking about them a perfect example is like you know in nazi germany we talk about the holocaust and how horrific right. that was and and the six million um jewish people who who were murdered and it's like yes genocidal that is horrific do you know and do you know who ended up racking up a larger body count mao or or stalin you know, the, these individuals that th throughout history, we kind of look at them as like the backup seat or they're, they're the people on the bench. And it's like, dude, they were doing horrible things. I'm not saying they were worse than Hitler, but it's like, man, they were in the running for certain. And we don't talk about that. And all of that to say that we we have gotten into a society where everything's so bloody politicized that immediately when we bring up the, you know, the racial stuff inside of that day and we talk about you know, what, what it is to, to have privilege and, and opportunity in the fourth day of recovery coach Academy, you can see the political lines immediately throw oh, themselves yeah. up. I mean, it's, it's palatable how quickly you can see the, the politics enter the conversation. And I don't, I don't know if people do it on purpose. I think it's just so naturally ingrained in the conversation at this point that it just manifests itself without wanting it to, but it's like, how, how can we have this conversation 
trying to remove the politics. And I think that we do a decent job or we try to do that on a fourth day, but we don't have a lot of time to do it. And so, right. I mean, I, I definitely, I agree with what you're saying. Cause when we talk about racial justice or social justice, I mean, there's a lot of different things that's being called. We, we think very much we have the Democrats and we have the Republican, the, the liberals and the conservatives and the conservatives are or the libertarians. <laughs> they don't count. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's not enough of you. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so it, yeah, that was, <laughs> so we have um, these two parties where we think like conservative equals racism and liberal equals the woke movement, the, the, the social rights. And we have that such, I think, ingrained because like a lot of the upper ups, some of the conversations that happen, some of them I hear them, I'm like, man, <laughs> kind of giving everyone a bad rep on your side, you know, because they, they say these things that are, that are racist or that are very, very progressive, almost to a, a, a bad point. Yeah, you know, and progressive like, to the point where it's like, okay, you're now talking about removing rights from other people, right? Like that's dangerous. Yep. That you like, we history's tried that hasn't been successful. Why are we doing it again? Mm -hmm. You know, and and I agree completely. Yeah, and it's like we've become so brainwashed to think that these social justice are not even just social justice, but a lot of things inside of our society are tied to one select party or another. And I mean, I, I really do respect, I actually was talking to somebody, um, her name was Emily. I was talking to her outside of my apartment and we were having a conversation about like the political tension um, inside of our society. I'm guessing that both of us had different political beliefs. I would just assume that from our conversation, um, but there wasn't any argument. Like we talked about some of that stuff and we're both pretty much on the same page as far as like, I agree with stuff from both sides. You know, I, I see both sides and I see like some very beneficial things and I see where some are taking it too far on both sides. And it's like trying to decent or depoliticize that, I think is something we really need to strive to do. Like take away the two, two fighting sides and on our humanization level. So like when we're talking about on a political level, it makes sense, you know, obviously like we need to have, you know, this guy versus this guy or whatever, you know, I don't know. It's kind of stupid. It's kind of arbitrary, but. Super arbitrary. Let's ask Joe Rogan. I hear him talk about it. it was like yeah. <laughs> it's the most outdated thing. A president is the most outdated thing we we have. I can't remember exactly mm -hmm. what he said, but it was funny. Um, so when we're talking about a humanized level, we have such a tendency to dehumanize because of the other, right? So like you're you're a conservative, so obviously you're you're a racist piece of this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. So you don't deserve an opinion. Versus you're a liberal, so you're a whack job, and you're you're this, that, the other thing. So we dehumanize each other. Yep. And I see this time and time again. And dehumanization, you brought it up uh, actually during Recovery Coach Academy, historically leads to genocide. Yeah. Historically speaking. And this has turned into quite the political discussion here. Um, <laughs> but it leads to genocide. Welcome so to like, Meditation Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> who knows what we're going to talk yeah. about. Um, it's, it's sad to see because I see it like where people just like one of my coworkers, um, you know, figured out my political leaning. He's like, just judge, super judgmental about it. And almost like to a point, you're not human. The old coworkers, not, not in my job currently. Mm. This was like back a gap. Um, and like, you're almost not human because of the belief you have. And then it's so dangerous because then we start devaluing human life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me because like, I can't even say what side of the political aisle I lean on. You know, I, I probably lean in more into libertarian. If I had to, if I had to say something, I'm more like, do what you want sort of thing. Like if it doesn't affect me, if you're, if you're not harming well, me. Yeah. And it's, I think it's, it's like, you know, social issues definitely lean further liberal on mm -hmm. many of them. I mean, it's like people should have rights. People should be able to do, you know, take care of their family and do what they need to do a hundred percent, you know, some other financial issues or some other issues, conservative, mm -hmm. because it's like, it's just how I was raised and, and I've never not known a different system than that. So it's like, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to be talked to, uh, talked to and had a conversation with, you know, right. and I'm, here's the thing I feel like, and I don't know if my wife would agree with this, but I feel like I'm a fairly reasonable person. Like <laughs> I'm willing to have, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm willing to have a conversation about things and, and here's the thing. And I know that you've seen this. So I, I'm, I don't, I think I'm in decent company. I've admitted when I'm wrong or I've admitted, I've had my opinion swayed by you before of like, mm, you're probably right. That's a fair, that's a fair point that you're making. And I didn't think about it that way. Um, and, and I think that's a skill and I do believe it's sad that that's a skill, but I believe that that's a skill that, that is in short supply in our society right now of right. the ability to, to come to the table and say, I'm coming to this with preconceived notions. 
let's get that off the t- like <laughs> be very clear with that being said i'm willing to be swayed mm-hmm. i'm willing to be you know if i i know that i haven't thought of all the variables here and you might right. give me a variable where it's like that's actually a really good point and i've had that happen so many times and by the grace of of, of my god that i've gotten that through becoming management and through becoming a senior partner and or a junior partner and all that kind of stuff in the company, because it's forced me to say like, there are going to be people that, you know, I'm, I'm ruling from the top down and I'm seeing things in one way, but then there's people that are like walking it out who are going to see it a different way. And I need to listen to those people because they're going to have a better sense of what needs to happen. Barring it's like, there's not some nefarious thing that can happen legally. I need to listen to the people that are actually walking it out. But I, to your point earlier, I think, especially like with the individual at your last job who, who felt that way. I'm under the impression oftentimes that first and foremost, we, we need to stop having political discord on line period, mm-hmm. just period. But we, we, <laughs> on the internet, is that what you're saying? On the internet, like yeah. at all. And, and people may argue tooth and nail from that. It's like, here's the reality though. It is so easy. And they've done, loads of research um, about this and I'll, I'll have to dig up some papers and we'll maybe talk about it on a meditation one of these days, but there have been loads of research about how pe- people are more willing to display extreme opinions on things like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube comments, because right. there's not a face associated with them because they feel like there's a level of anonymity. So they're able to say what they want to say or say what they're feeling in the moment. And I think that's a key point there in the moment mm-hmm. like they they're having a heated discussion so they you know they throw the baby out with the bathwater a lot of the time when normally i think they may be reasonable but they say these things and then it's it's taken as like look how extreme that side is and it's the same thing it's like turn off the freaking news yeah because the news it's propaganda at this point on both sides let's let like don't make any mistake yeah. like you people are it's opinion journalism i was talking to a really good friend of mine um who, who shout out to him, he's in Brazil right now uh, with uh, his lovely partner. And they're going to be coming back up here sooner or later. Um, I hope maybe, <laughs> maybe they, they might enjoy the sun too much. Um, but uh, th- we were talking and something really occurred to me about 10 years ago, a little bit. No, it was, it was more than 10 years, like 20 years ago. Wow. That's, wow. Time flies. But uh, the daily show with Jon Stewart, came on and it was really one of the first of its kind you had a comedy show that revolved around the news and uh, and it was all comedy 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 and there at that point in time there was a news anchor um his name was bill o'reilly and it was with fox news and constantly john stewart who is a comedian who head of the daily show on comedy central then gave it over to to uh i think his name trevor noah i believe his name is um, but at that time, John Stewart and this Bill O'Reilly gentleman from Fox News were constantly getting into it. And what I back then I thought like, yeah, that's right. And now the more that I look at it, I'm like, no, John was wrong. John kept on telling John Stewart, this comedian kept on telling Bill O'Reilly, you're the news. You need to report it X, Y and Z. I'm I'm a comedian. My job is to make people laugh like and. Back then, I was like, yeah, that's right. But now, as time has evolved, I'm like, no, you were an opinion journalist. You were what the news is today. The news today is what he was. Mm -hmm. It's all opinion journalism. Everything has a a slant or a a skew to it. It's all what we've talked about of creating that echo chamber. If I want to have my opinions ratified, what do I do? I watch this news station. If I want to have my opinions on the other, watch that news station. And very rarely there is an unbiased news station. And here's, I know I might get in trouble for this, but oh, well, there's too many people who are like, no, but this is unbiased, but this is unbiased. Like, no, it's not. They right. show me the news article and it's like, I start looking at it. I'm like, this is an op-ed piece still. Like you, you're so brainwashed to it. that you're like, well, these are the known people that, that are that brainwash people. These are the known people that, that say, you know, are, are left-leaning or right-leaning, but this one over here, this is fine. It's like, you read it. What, what are you talking about? They're doing the same thing. Yes. They're like, they're Democrat or Republican liberal or conservative light, like there, so you can't, it's not as heavy as the other thing is, but it's clearly still an opinion piece. And that's all, in my opinion, that's all that journalism and journalism is today. It's all opinion pieces. Cause that's what makes the money. 
Right. Because when people have strong opinions like you do, like you and I, we hang out. Do we differ in opinions sometimes? Never. No, but when we're always agreeing, we're always agreeing on everything all the time. No, but we, we have differing opinions on some things and we discuss those out mm-hmm. and we discuss our viewpoints. And I think we try to often find a middle ground, but ultimately sometimes the, I hit him with a bat. Sometimes he hits me with a, a bat and I hit him with a flip flop. But ultimately we, we usually have a vast amount of things that we do agree on. And that's something that I think, you know, uh, in, in when you and I started our friendship, we started off as mentor mentee. I just like to point out that was my phone. That was his that, phone. There's the Easter egg, guys. It is 7:30 in the morning, <laughs> and it's still happening. So that's to tell you, that's a good thing. Though he's probably working. Um, but we we started off mentor mentee um, in in our friendship, and mm-hmm. I still remember there. I mean, I remember it clear as day because at the beginning you really didn't want to hang out. You wanted to talk a little bit, whatever, whatever. And everything flipped when we were in the car one night after I had taken you out uh, for dinner or whatever. And we started talking about, you know, some of the, your belief systems that were based in, you know, how you were raised in your church. And you were afraid to share those not only with me, but with people around you, because you thought people were going to think you were crazy or, or weird, or you thought people were going to be like, not there with you or not, you know, up to your level or whatever. And I started talking to you and said, no, you know, I believe all those things. No, you're absolutely right. I'm a hundred percent down with that. But also I believe this on top of that. And we started a really good conversation. And at least in my opinion, that's where this shenanigans ended up starting because, you know, we found that commonality, but it's like, that's how people view their news now is they just want commonality. Right. They want, they have their opinion. They're walking around. And most of the funny thing is for a lot of people, at all for a lot of people their political opinion doesn't even affect their actual day that much but you know what i mean like they're 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 going to work they're doing their job the guy that's working on the gm floor isn't thinking about like oh trump or oh biden like he's just talking about the game last night Mm -hmm. if anything i worked on the gm floor they don't want to talk about politics (laughs) they don't they're not interested in it right so Quite frankly, I don't think anyone at work wants to talk about politics unless you work in politics. Fair point. Yeah, Yeah, fair. I I wouldn't want to have that discussion, but I mean, so there's a couple things and then I'm going to start us off on a new discussion because there's something you said that I really want to hit on that I feel like is very applicable to, since we're doing this for recoveries, we might as well make a little bit about recovery. But yes, I, I very much agree. And this is something, so there's a few things you said earlier. One, that you're willing to be persuaded. When I came here, I was raised by very conservative people. Um, my mom is very, uh, she's conservative, but she's not like ultra conservative. She's just kind of more the social issues. She's, she His more, mom's a saint, by the she way. Is, she's awesome. Um, so in case you're listening, mom, I love you. No, <laughs> um, but my mom is very- I love you, mom. <laughs> yeah, conservative on financial issues. And then like, like you said, liberal on most social issues. That's where I find myself standing a lot of the times as well. But she didn't really vocalize um, her political beliefs. My dad is very conservative on on all issues, all issues, and he was he's pretty vocal about it. Um, my stepdad is also very conservative um, on both issues and is <clears throat> doesn't talk about a whole lot. And then my grandparents are all conservative, um, given their age and everything. That makes a lot of sense. Um, small town Iowa as well. Your and grandparents are awesome. Also, I've met them. They are. So my your stepdad's awesome too. I just want to throw that. I don't want cool. him. I don't want him cool. to feel just, left out. He's a good guy. You listening? You're, He's a good guy. Cool. That guy goes. I mean, yeah. say what you will, but that guy will will trudge through muck and mire to make sure that his own is taken care of. Hundred percent, man. Hundred percent. Um. So it's just this whole like dynamic of how I was raised and ended up coming out because who was vocal was very conservative. So that was where my political belief really was. I was homeschooled and so I not have a whole lot of outside opinion coming into that. Um, so that was kind of where my belief was. Coming up here to Lansing, my political views have changed radically. Um, so like I, I have adopted a very, a lot on social issues, I look a lot more liberal and not, not fully because I think there's some stuff that I'm like, I don't really like that. Like you said, when we start talking about taking people's rights away and stuff mm-hmm. like that, on either side, that's not okay. So like, that's where I also don't lean hyper conservative because they're also about not letting people have their rights. And it's like, everybody should have the same rights. Everybody should have the same rights. Everybody should be left alone. Exactly. Just like leave people alone, man. If, yep. if, if they want to do what they want to do, let them do it. If, yep. if, unless it's like robbing somebody or hurting a third party, it doesn't matter. And, um, and as far as, you know, whether it be socialism or whatever you're talking, I get it. We need a fire department. I get it. We need police department. I get it. We need all that. Mm-hmm. 
for the most part, leave other, everybody else alone. Like under, right. like we need social programs. We need all that stuff. Leave everybody else alone. Yep. hundred <laughs> percent. That's, that's pretty much where I'm at with it. Um, and then it's also like, I, I, I do find, I see where they're saying some of this stuff too. Like when we talk about hate speech and stuff like that, we can't start, in my opinion, can't start to illegalize free speech. Yes. Um, even if we're going to classify it as hate speech, but I see the point there because it's like, you, no one wants to be talked to like that and it's not okay. But we can't make laws around that. That's more of a social issue, I would say. Well, it's social issue, and the big the big problem is it's dependent on specific individuals. Because right. when we start to equate <clears throat> speech with with violence, and here's the thing: we talk about we talk about like being brutally honest in our classes mm-hmm. and brutality being Don't an act that. of violence. Right. Yeah, like so we I understand where you're coming from <laughs> for sure. But when we talk about the speech is violence area. Right we always have to recognize like your opinion is somewhat arbitrary sometimes because you know, where your speech is violent to another individual, it might not be quite as violent for another individual, or it might be violent. Plus the other thing you said is violent. And it, you, when you start to limit hate speech or when you start to limit speech in general, first off, who, where's the barometer at who gets to decide what is good, what is bad. That's the big one. And then secondly, that's, you see, that's uh, really quick. That's what I was going to say as well is like, who, the, the problem with a lot of notice of social things is like who makes the standard and that's where you can start like what do we qualify as hate speech um is it something that offends a majority of people is it something that you know like where does that where's that line because there's words that we won't say in society anymore it's yeah, like it's good naturally like, yeah. naturally they were they were stricken from the lexicon the zeitgeist all agreed we don't say those words anymore that's a good thing. The zeitgeist. The zeitgeist. It's the the collective conscience of of all of us. I knew that. I knew yeah, that. I knew that. I watched a documentary once on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah. It was made by some guy in a basement. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Whatever. He's yeah. my uncle. Um, <laughs> no, but it, it, when when we collectively start to agree, we ban words. We do. We ban words, and you can still say those words. That doesn't mean there's not going to be social consequence for saying those words. Right, as it should be. As it should be. You right. know, there should be. That's that's what there should be. And I think maybe I don't know. Maybe in having this conversation, even my opinions being swayed a little bit of of governmentally. The social the 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 social consequence shouldn't come from the government. I guess right. it should come from society as a whole. Yep. It should like society has agreed this is not a good thing. You don't say this. Not government well, top down rule. We make a law, and if you break it, we throw you away. Yeah, and we have to be careful of the violence following the consequences. Yes, um, I will say that I don't think political violence is. The, the, I guess there's times where where extreme things need to happen throughout history. We see that um we see it we see it in our amendments you know that there's times where where there's like the well-armed militia whatever you know like so we see there's a purpose to political violence when it's necessary so i don't want to like outdo it all together and that may be very controversial but we have to be careful not to be violent in our reaction to social things i think that sure. there's better ways to handle that on a human level um so that that's my opinion on that but <clears throat> the the other part i wanted to wanted to touch on too so i was kind of hitting on that is like my how my opinion has changed and i think that's very important that like you said we come with an open-mindedness um like i had preconceived notions i was you know i was 19 when i got up here i was raised in that environment so that was what my belief is i still very much do find myself on and as far as economics i think conservatives have a very good economic plan in a lot of areas um i think not all but definitely a lot a lot and i think there are a lot of areas where it needs improvement you know like where we see inflation happening but we're not seeing wages match that but we can't raise the wages because then we'll see inflation go up and it's like kind of stuck you know damned if you do damned if you don't and i i agree wholeheartedly you know when we we do need to because there is economic there is social justice to be Mm -hmm. had there economically there is conversations to be had there i agree 150 percent. i think that that it's clear you know the people that are saying well minimum wage they shouldn't be raised is like go to almost every other first world country their minimum wages are larger or higher than ours and they can say what well, the economy and this that and something else and it's just like here's the thing and this is you know it's the tricky the sticky wicket if you will the problem is once again people are relying on the halls of power that they've given authority to to pull these levers for them here's the thing in people's businesses pay start paying people a higher minimum wage 
you you start. And here's the thing: don't rely on the government to set that price point for you because Isn't it, uh, Jack in the Box or something is like fifteen dollars an hour. Yeah, and Costco sixteen, and Costco is plus. Costco sixteen is Costco. Costco is min, uh, starting wage is like sixteen, and barely anybody makes sixteen there. It's more than that, and it has benefits hmm. for like quarter time employees. I know people who are like hairstylists who went to go get a part-time job at Costco just for the insurance. So it's like when you leave it to it, you know, you can't expect people to be moral or ethical. Like that's that you can hope for that. A lot of times that ain't the case, especially when there's a lot of money tied into it. It's just right. not going to happen. They're going to, they're going to function in their own best interest and and make sure that the, their bottom line only skyrockets. When you look at government entities though, and you see, politicians and then you understand how a bill comes into play and you understand that like there's these things called lobbyists and their entire job is to be is to be paid to be the representative of corporate interests inside of the halls of power to make sure that x y and z is tied into a bill and here's the thing i know lobbyists do you know what they do they have they they are functioning on behalf of whoever is paying them. They're they're basically assassins. They're hitmen. And and one lot. Well, here's the problem. One lobbyist can represent like forty different interests. Like they and they're just getting paid. And, and they come forward to a senator or or whoever it is with a bill. And that bill is already constructed. The bit the bill the lobbyist wrote the bill or or the the corporation wrote the bill and gave it to the lobbyist and then gave it to whoever this politician is and saying scratch your you know you scratch our back we'll scratch yours we'll make sure that you stay in your power we'll make sure that money is dedicated into your fund to stay in your position of power and that's where super PACs and all this other stuff come in and they end up these bills that get end up voted in mm-hmm. are are the they didn't even have the hands of the politician that was voted in on it. Yeah. And it's just like, that's an issue. Mm-hmm. That's a serious problem. Like if we're talking about things that are happening in society right now, why aren't we talking about that? We're instead talking. Never even heard about that. Well, exactly. But we're, we're talking about the, we're talking about legitimate things like the Derek Chauvin thing that is, that is happening in the midst of us talking George, that the, okay, the police officer the, yeah. that, okay. that, that uh, killed George Floyd. That's, and, and here's the thing, even me saying that there's immediately going to be two sides of the aisle. There's going to be, some, well, George Floyd died from uh, overdose and he had right. fentanyl in his system and this, that, something else. And, and he did things that was, that was okay by the police department standard, yada, yada, yada. It's like, okay, why is this political? I don't know. You know, a he, man was murdered. A man was yeah. murdered, but not, but even more than that. And I've, I've actually preached a sermon on this. It's like, okay. For those of you that aren't going to hold Derek Chauvin accountable, you know, he then it's clear that whatever that police department's policy was, was ultimately focal pointed and manifested through that man. So if it was so that he could, you know, be on someone's neck and he died because of asphyxiation or he died because of overdose and halluc- uh, and and I don't remember what the, the technical term is, but essentially he, he delirium. Mm-hmm. Um, if that is the case, either way, that needs to be changed inside of that police department, that right. that whatever that is. But the biggest problem that I have, and, and I saw this right at the post of this, and it was something that I was like, really? When that video came out, everybody immediately formed of, of opinions. He murdered that man. Horrible, horrific, awful, awful. Then another video came out of George Floyd post that happening. And people immediately started changing, like, he clearly was on drugs, he clearly this, that, and something right. else, you know, stand up for the rights of the police, this, that. It's like, okay, not arguing any of that. Right. What I'm saying is, why are we having our opinions swayed so easily? Why are we not either taking all the evidence in, or why are we searching for a reason to say that that police officer was right and he was wrong? And now, you know... And I'm trying not to get hyper political here. Yeah, and I, I can see, I can see it. you're trying to like, you're getting into some like very, very touchy territory. So I think we need to be careful, obviously, of what we're saying, and not not say anything that's very. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to censor myself, but I also don't want to be insensitive to what's going on. Um, Absolutely, because what's going what's going on right now is there's a trial of a man who is basically second degree murder. I think is the charge. Mm-hmm. Whether or not he, if that's going to stick. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of ramifications both ways, right? Because 
there's people that want more charges. There's people that want him executed. There's, you know, there's people that say he should get off. There's people that say that that second charge is like, why are we, why has this reached the boiling point? Why are we here? Why are, that's, I guess, my question. Now, ultimately, I think we do need to bring it back into recovery, which is, you know, the reason I think we're talking about this is recoveries are talking about this type of stuff too. You know, people we, I've, I've talked to recoveries in recovery circles and recovery coaches who are thinking about this and thinking about like, what's the future of the country? Mm-hmm. What's the, what do we do? Like, what, how do we fix this issue? Yeah. And I'll say, I mean, for people in, in early recovery, at least for me, so I have my opinions on this, but I very rarely talk about it. I don't, I don't, I don't invest myself too much into it. Um, because quite frankly, politics do not affect my day to day life. Sure. Um, and people will disagree with me on that. They say that it, I, I've had people tell me that my lack of interest in politics means that I don't care about our country or I don't care about my future or I don't care about the issues. And I'm like, I do care. I care very much. And I think that things need to happen. But quite frankly, I can't risk to care about that. Otherwise, I'm going to get high. Yep. Because I mean, quite frankly, if my if 100 percent of my energy is going into that, psh, <laughs> you know, like if I went into meetings, and was talking, yeah, psh, you know what that means. Um, but if I was talking about politics in meetings. Instead of talking about, man, I, I really having a hard day today. And mm-hmm. I, I thought about using and I didn't. And my desire to stay sober stronger, my desire to get high today. And that's awesome. You know, um, if I don't go in and talk about that sort of thing or talk about my problem and how people can help me, then I will not make it. So I need to be very careful about what my energy is focused in on. Quite frankly, I could I could be. I could be a. Uh, me homeless man i could be i could be uh i i I mean literally our economy could crash yeah or everything could go to shuckles 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 i'm gonna that's my new favorite word i don't know how much we're allowed to cut it all could go to shuckles we can cut as much as we want the problem is and then you get an explicit warning and all this other stuff so i I don't really shuckles it is i don't really like to cuss that much anyways in polite company only when i'm uh you know hanging out well uh you're in the wrong place for that friend (laughs) So I'm, ha- I'm polite company. Look at me no, moving up you, in the world, mom. The listeners. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, but yeah, it's like, uh, I, I feel like I honestly do believe this, that everything else could go and there will be problems and there will be problems that I will face, but ultimately my serenity is what's going to stay with me. Yeah. Um, and, and life may suck at times. Like life sucks at times now. Like I live in a very privileged, privileged place. Um, you know, I have a good job. I have an apartment. I have, I have food on my table. I have a, I have a car, you know, I can put gas in that car. I live in a very privileged nation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. But there's the other side of realizing, like, even if that went away, I would like to believe that I could still keep that serenity because my focus try, it tries not to be on the material, tries not to be on the politics, tries not to be on the country. My my focus is inwardly. Yes. You, you know what I'm saying? No, 100 percent. Yeah. And then I think that that I, that needs to be the battle cry for every recovery is is the focus needs to be inward we can participate in the in the bread and circuses that is put before us we can participate in the conversations about politics and and religion and and whatever is good bad and different but i think ultimately it comes down to what are you doing for your recovery today? How does this affect your recovery today? And if it's a negative impact and why are you continue to proceed in it? Right. And, and when it comes to politics in particular, it is so easy to be overwhelmed by what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. It feels like everything's changing so quickly. It feels like, you know, that, that things are worse than they are. It feels like, you know, when, when things, you know, when, when, weird stuff like the Mr. Potato Head, uh, you know, them, them taking away Mr. and just putting potato head or, or the, the Dr. Seuss books or whatever, right. immediately people jump to like, it's the end of democracy. It's the end of freedom of speech. They're changing everything. The world is clashing. And it's just like, let's all take a breath. Right. Okay. Chill. Let's stop real quick. Okay. Let's, let's stop with ramping up the rhetoric to the point of like, it's the end of the world. Right. And instead, like, you know, and maybe this is maybe this is something that that the the nation or the world can take out of recoveries of like, how does this affect yourself today? Mm-hmm. Okay, we can have conversations about how to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. But as far as today is concerned, what are you going to do today to make sure that you're okay? Yeah, and I will say, I think that I think that the political stuff, I guess, the social issues and the economic issues and whatnot, do make a very big impact in recoveries' lives for the sense of like. 
I think integrity, we talk about our training during the stages of recovery. Integrity is a key point in a lot of those different stages. Um, I think integrity, it's one, a very important thing to me. Like, like you said, we say, we're going to do something stupid. Integrity. Just, yeah, exactly. You say, we're going to do something stupid. And I show up to do it because I said I was going to do it mm -hmm. like record early in the morning. <sighs> no. Um, so it's not even eight o'clock in the morning yet for those listening. I know it's crazy. Um, I love how I talked for 40 minutes about like political and social issues. And then we're like, but recoveries don't think about that. Yeah. No. <laughs> but okay. So this is my thought. Like I, like I said, I have an opinion on these things and it influences my integrity because my integrity is sticking to my morals and ethics. That's like the definition of integrity is sticking to your morals and ethics. Yes. Part of it. I think there's a second part that's like in doing what you say and all that sort of stuff too is in there. So my morals and ethics do get very much, especially social issues do get swayed by that a lot. You know, like, I think we should treat people with decency, respect, and treat everyone equally. Get out of my house. I know. <laughs> everyone else I tell you, get out. So you need to get out too. No. <laughs> um, so that, that does persuade my day-to-day -day life. Um, quite frankly, like I, I, sometimes I'm actually careful and conscious of sure. what I'm saying to people, you know, because I'm like, I do not want to offend them. I do not want them to think that I'm judging them. I, I don't want them to think that they're less than me. And it's not like, I don't want them to look at me like that. I don't want them to look at me as a racist bigot. I don't care about that. Look at me however you want. Your opinion of me means very little to me. Mm -hmm. uh, as they say in the 12 step fellowship, my, your opinion is not in my business. <laughs> um, shots fired, shots fired. Yeah. Right. You're, you're on. No, I'm not. I, am I, am I still on? Oh, okay. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> so ultimately your opinion means very little to me. So my thing is, is I don't want to make you feel some sort of way because of who you are, whether that be gay, whether it be transgender, whether that be black, whether it be white, I don't care. You know, it's like, whatever, whatever your, your, your identification is, or whatever you were born, born like, or born with, you know, for people with disabilities, whatever that might be, all those things. It's like, I'm going to talk to you like you're a decent human being. And I try to be conscious of that because I know sometimes like the way that I was the way I've been talked to and stuff. Like I grew up in a small town in Iowa. A lot of people were very racist. A lot of people are very in insensitive to stuff. And I, I try to be conscious to not let that like old childhood subconscious slip out or something and just be a decent human being. Well, I, I think you just hit it on the, on the money there, man. It's like, you were raised in a situation. I was raised in a situation, you know, much of my family is from Hobunk nowhere in Michigan where it's like the, being racist and having certain views is par for the course. And guess what? Much of my family still has those views, mm -hmm. but there is an, there is a conscience that has to come to play where it's like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be completely able to abolish and terminate those thoughts. Do they pop up? Yes. But what I can do is interact with them. What I can do is saying that's inappropriate. That's not right. right. That's not you know better now. You've learned more. You've read more. You've talked to more. You've talked to certain people of certain, uh, you know, uh, genders and, and race and ethnicity and all those things. You've talked to those people now and you know that this garbage that your your family pro propagated in your head is not accurate. Now, I was fortunate enough that my immediate family wasn't like that at all. Right. But I do have extended family still that they, they talk like that. Now, do I try to hang, not hang out with them? Oh yeah. There's just parts <laughs> of my family that I have cut out completely. Cause it's just like, right. no, thank you. <laughs> You're like, this conversation is very uh, not okay. <laughs> yeah. But for the most part, man, it's, if you have, or have, if you've ever struggled with family members or things like that, there is, it, what's the best way to say this? Once you get into recovery, Ignorance is no longer an excuse, mm -hmm. plain and simple. Knowledge is out there. Knowledge is out there. You can have, you have the ability in front of you to go possess it. Now ignorance go do it. Ignorance is an excuse once. Let's say that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So Ign when, when you get called out for being ignorant, then you should probably just go do some research of some sort. Yeah. And, you know? and if you're ignorant inside of yourself of like, you clearly understand that there's gaps of knowledge in specific areas that you have the ability to go down to ride the bus to the library and go read about it. Or heck, you probably got a smartphone. You know, pull it up on the internet, go find free Wi-Fi somewhere at a McDonald's and pull that up and start reading about it. Watch YouTube videos, watch, watch Ted talks. You know, I don't, I read. Yes, I have books. I mean, I have quite an extensive library in my house, but I would much prefer to watch a Ted talk or to listen to an audio book while I'm working out or to listen to a podcast of, of experts talking in Maybe the field. Like lifeboat addiction recovery cast. 
I said experts, yeah. not too <laughs> ridiculous. We do talk to experts every uh, Monday and when, or and Friday, but not to jackaroos that are doing this. So, yeah, right. Two unpolitical political people over here. Yeah, yeah. unpolitical <laughs> political. I'm the most unpolitically political person you will ever meet. Yeah, right. But yeah, it's. I feel like I feel like it's kind of cool the blessing that we have. Cause like when I was, when I was getting high, like I, I actually hung out with like white supremacists when I was doing meth. Um, that was pretty common where I was at, um, you know, biker club, stuff like that too. That just, if you guys have been around those scenes, you know, that obviously there's a lot of race that goes into that and a sure. lot of like there, there's a lot of segregation. Um, and I feel blessed that I was able to get out of that situation. And I, I honestly, I always had conflicts with that sort of stuff. Like when someone would say something, man, I was like, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't feel right. Yeah. You know, there's like, I never fit in with those people. Um, it was just spewing hate. Yeah. And it's like, that's, it's not okay, man. And, and still, it's like, I still hear those things. And I'm like, uh huh. You know, like when I, like if I heard somebody like uh, talk about homeless people um, is being less than or being like a bum or being crazy or, you know, I'll look at that tweaker over there or something like that. And it's like, or saying that to somebody more than anything. Like if you're having that conversation yourself, probably shouldn't, but whatever. You're not harming somebody at least. But when they're saying something to that, they're belittling someone. Yeah. It's like, that's not okay. There's nothing okay about that. And I feel blessed that I was able to come into recovery. And like, I honestly, I say this and I, I kind of say it jokingly sometimes, but I really do mean it. Cause yeah, people hear me like say, Oh, I love you, man. And hang up the phone. And they're like, do you just tell everyone you love them? It's like, yeah, I love everybody. Yeah. But I really try to love everybody. Like, even if I don't know somebody, like I don't probably love you, but I try to respect you. Yes. You know, and if I do know you, you're probably like more like a brother to me. Like I would, I'd probably do as much as I could for you without harming myself. Well, and I think ultimately I, cause I'm somewhat in the same situation, not to the extreme of the biker bars and all that crap, but it's, it's, I had to learn that respect was due to everybody that I meet immediately off the get. Mm -hmm. That was something that I had to instill in myself. That was something that I had, I had to learn not to say my parents didn't try to instill that in me, but I just didn't comprehend it because right. they definitely did. But for the longest time, I acted as if like you had to earn my respect. And I still hear that nowadays. You got to earn my respect. And it's like nobody has to earn your respect because right. who are you that <laughs> I need your respect? Right. You sh everybody deserves your respect until they don't. Mm -hmm. Like that is plan like it, the and when you start to when that small switch and that small type of thinking switches on of like instead of people trying to earn my respect, they, they already have it. It's just something that's given to them and it can be taken away from them. Your life changes, man. Yeah. When you start respecting people, regardless of who they are in front of you and it, immediately right off the get, people start to like you. Right. People start to want to hang out with you because it's like, this person's a nice person. No, he's actually a decent human being. That's cool. Right. Yeah. And I'll say in this field, bro, like that, that is probably one of the most invaluable tools you can have is to show decent human respect. Cause like, quite frankly, you see some really people that are really down in the dumps. People have had a really hard life. People who are looking tore up from the floor up, you know, people who are maybe even violent or something like that have a history. Maybe they have a CSD. Maybe they have a, uh, um, maybe they have assault charges. Maybe they murdered someone. I don't know, but under uh, the capacity for change, I guess, is what that would be partially like understanding that person might not be the same person as they were when that stuff happened. Maybe I don't know the full story. Maybe something else happens. Obviously, there's worse things than others. But like having a decent like blank slate with people of not judging due, due to the past, you know, not like when I first met you, bro, I judged you so hard. <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> like, that's why I was so uncomfortable talking at first is because there's a couple things. I'm like, why does this guy want to be my friend? Because mm -hmm. nobody in my addiction wanted to be my friend just to be my friend they wanted to be my friend because at that point in time i had drugs mm -hmm. or i had x y and z that they wanted and that's why they wanted to be my friend you know now it was so hard for me to comprehend that because you like would take me out to dinner i'd be like where's this guy buying me dinner like i don't know <laughs> mm -hmm. this is weird um but like it's it was so strange to me and foreign but you you treated me as if i was a decent human being and you started me off with a blank slate and that was like where that connection started because I'd never been treated like that in my active addiction. Sure. You know, or anybody but my family. My family was nice to me because they're my family. You know, yeah. we, there's a relationship there. But a guy, I literally was like, meant you at a meeting and you're like, or Mike's like, hey, this is going to be your mentor. Or, or he told you and you talked to me, actually. And you're like, oh, I'm going to be your mentor. And I was like, who's this random shaved headed yeah. doofus? No. <laughs> Neanderthal. Yeah. Uh, 
didn't mean to call you a doofus, but uh, I feel like that's one of the that's one of the nicer things I could have called yeah. you guys. Fair point. <laughs> Fair point. But yeah, it's just treating like that opened me up so much. And like, if you're in longer term recovery, like I've seen this happen in meetings where like people are shocked. I've heard people talk about it. I went to my first meeting and someone invited me out to dinner afterwards. And I was like, what? I'll pay for you. What? You know? Yeah. And it's such a cool experience. Like when someone treats you with respect and doesn't look at your past as a reason to judge you and, and just treats you with that blank slate of respect that they would treat a, a, an upstanding member of society, you know? And it's, I mean, it's weird and it's profound when you get to that point, but just like that, man. We're already through our Wednesday cast. We, we burn through it. So as you know, every Monday we are doing the science of addiction. Uh, we are in the midst of the ACEs training right now, um, which I, I suggest everybody listens to adverse childhood experience. Uh, we have two experts that are doing it. Yeah. Um, it is certainly worth it. Uh, there's like extra reading and it's just something that, you know, we were very privileged and oper- we, we saw a very cool opportunity and we just definitely took advantage of it. Right. I got an interview. I want to say really quick, got an interview, Dr. Paul, and he talked about the, that how much sense it makes to talk about trauma with addiction because we're in a trauma based field. It was insightful to me to interview the guy for an hour. So very much tune into that podcast, man, that trauma in the early childhood affecting your later on life. It's such a, there's such a correlation there. And I think it's, I think it goes it, parallel hand in hand, hand in hand, yeah. uh, you know, it, and it's just really cool. But every Wednesday we do meditations and every Friday we do interviews. Have a good one.